What might be shocking to Western Bible prophecy analysts is that Islam even confirms what is written in Scripture regarding Antichrist, who is described in Revelation 19.11 as riding on a white horse, being none other than Imam Mahdi in Islam. The early Muslim transcription of Prophet Muhammad's hadith, Kaab ibn Ahbar confirms this, and I quote, I find the Mahdi recorded in the books of the prophets. For instance, the book of Revelation says, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, he that sat on him, went forth conquering and to conquer. Egyptian authors, Muhammad ibn Izzat and Muhammad Arif, then go on to say, it is clear that this is the man who is the Mahdi, who will ride the white horse and judge by the Quran, and with whom will be men with marks of prostration on the foreheads. Even the mark on the forehead is part of this mechanism. Muslim scholars do not reject the role of Islam being Antichrist. They fully accept it. Even taking pride in marking their foreheads is in Islam. This is the work of Antichrist who will come riding on a white horse. I watched as the Lamb, Jesus, opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like a thunder, Come, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent to conquest. The seals that follow this rider are war, famine, plagues, death, persecution, martyrdom of God's people, a great earthquake, and even the wrath of God. After this, the rider appears bent on conquests, and the world completely slides in chaos. The rider is given a white horse, which is an attempt to imitate Jesus when he returns. This imposter, the Antichrist, is also carrying a bow without any arrows. He is the bearer of false peace. Our Antichrist is their Messiah. Muslim scholars open the Bible, read about the Antichrist, and see their Savior. This must be seen as quite ironic, if not entirely prophetic. Now you are beginning to see what I was faced with when I began to study the Bible, the true word of the Almighty God. So who are the imperialists, Christians or Muslims? Who attempts to rule the world and force everyone to submit or be killed? Islam or Christianity? Which one is the religion of peace? In my view, a religion of peace is the kind of religion that if you curse it, its followers pray for you. Well, that's Christianity. The violent religion is the kind of religion that says, you better say that our religion is a religion of peace or we will kill you. According to the prophet Daniel, he, the Antichrist, will speak against the Most High and oppress the saints and try to change the set times and set laws. In this passage, we find an important clue, for by his actions, we can assess his origin. Not knowing how to deal with this piece of puzzle, Many students of Bible prophecy have speculated that the Antichrist will try to change cosmic laws. But the text infers no such thing. It simply says that he will desire to change two things, times, the accepted world calendar, and laws. If we simply take the text at its face value, we find a simple warning that the Antichrist will attempt to change the times, calendar, legal systems, and constitutions. He will attempt to invoke Islam's evil laws worldwide to replace every other law and constitution. Only God can change cosmic laws. So why teach that the Antichrist will change cosmic laws? Always be careful never to give attributes that belong to God and apply them to Satan. The Mahdi fits the bill. For he will attempt to change the law by instituting Islamic Sharia law as far as he is able to do so. Who else other than the Muslim would desire to change the times and laws? Every Islamic activist organization is crying it. Islam to the world. What does this mean? It means 
They want Islam to replace everything, worship, law, even the calendar. This activism already exists in every nation of the world. Behind all of the masks, they, are, they all desire to replace non-Islamic legal systems with Islamic Sharia law and replace every constitution with the constitution of the Caliphate. Do you think I am exaggerating? Earlier, I gave the example of Siraj Wahaj. Again, he was the first moderate Muslim to deliver the opening prayer before the U.S. House of Representatives. Yet when he spoke to a Muslim audience in New Jersey, what did he declare? Muslims should take over the United States and replace its constitutional government with a caliphate. Believe me, this Islamo-imperialist push for a caliphate is far more widespread than most think. Now let's address the issue of times. Besides the Gregorian calendar used in the West, there is also a Jewish, a Hindu, and a Muslim calendar, among others. But has there ever been a time when Jews or Hindus have tried to impose their religious calendar or laws onto the rest of the world? Islam, however, does have both its own calendar and laws, both of which are the first thing Islam has imposed in every country they've ruled. Keep in mind that the, the text says he attempts to change set times and laws. Yet the only, he only succeeds partially, but never on a global scale. Because like Nimrod in the story of the Tower of Babel, God will never allow the Antichrist to rule the entire world. Unlike most Western students of prophecy who think that the Antichrist governs the entire globe, God will stop Antichrist's attempt to create a one world government system. Jesus is the only king who will accomplish a one world government and it will be ruled from Jerusalem. So according to the Bible, the Antichrist is said to attempt to change times and laws. The religion of Islam fulfills this description to absolute day. The Antichrist will have no regard for women's rights. Women will have no voice in his empire. The Bible teaches about this. It says, neither shall he regard the gods of his fathers, nor the desire of women. We have already seen Muslim countries in which women struggle to gain their desired rights. In Saudi Arabia, women struggle to acquire rights to drive a car. In Afghanistan, women struggle to gain a desired education. In Turkey, women struggle with laws attempting to gradually reinstitute the hijab. The Antichrist will not only change constitutional laws, but civil laws as well. Everywhere in the Muslim world, women struggle to gain rights to be equal to their male counterpart. Women's rights in Islam are literally a fraction of what their male counterparts possess. According to Islamic law, a woman only inherits half of what the male inherits. In court, it takes the testimony of two women to equal the testimony of one man because Muhammad declared that women have half the mental capacity of a man. Many prophecy analysts have speculated that Daniel 11.37 is stating that the Antichrist will not have any regards for that which was the desire of all Jewish women. This disregard for women in Daniel 11.37 stems from the story of the fall of man. In the Bible, in Genesis, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 This prophecy was made right from the beginning of humanity. It states that Satan will hate the woman and her seed who will crush the head of the Antichrist. So, in other words, the Antichrist has a special hatred for women. Women's rights are nil in the empire of Antichrist. The verse should be interpreted naturally without reading into it. It does not say he does not desire women, as many say that the Antichrist is homosexual, but it says he does not honor the desire of women. He cares less about women's wants, rights, and needs. Though Muslim apologists often make the claim that Islam exalts the status of women, if so, where is the Muslim woman's right to marry a non-Muslim? 
you rarely ever hear of a Muslim woman marrying a Jewish or a Christian man. Why? Islam proclaims death to Muslim women who marry out of their faith. Yet it allows Muslim men to marry non-Muslim women. Christianity, on the other hand, admonishes both women and men not to marry out of the faith. Yet nowhere do we see any Christian edicts demanding the killing of anyone who marries out of the faith. In fact, it urges them to show good character in order that the unbelieving spouse would see the beauty of Christianity. For anyone who knows Islam, the idea that Islam offers equality to women is simply comical. Men are in charge of women, the Quran says, because Allah has made the one of them to excel over the other, that is the man over the woman, and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So the good women are therefore obedient and guard in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. As to those women on whose part ye fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first. Next, refuse to share their beds. And last, beat them. But if they return to obedience, seek not against them means of annoyance. For Allah is most high, great above all. Upon my detailed investigation of Lucifer in the Bible, it always ended up matching all the attributes given to Allah in the Quran. If Lucifer is described in the Bible as an angel, he seems to fit the angel Muhammad encountered. If Lucifer claims to be God, so does Muhammad's angel claim attributes that belong to deity, for he is, as Islam describes, invisible from Allah, who is breathed through Allah into all living, becoming the agent of creation. To top this all, even the biblical account of Lucifer being cast out of heaven seems to have an account in the Quran. Allah is Rabbul Falak in the Quran, Lord of the Dawn, and it is the same title given to Lucifer in the Bible. Allah in the Quran proclaimed that his spirit, the angelic medium, descended to earth with his angelic host as the holiest day in Islam. A similar account is described in the Bible. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Revelation 12, 9. No serious intellectual can argue that Islam's Allah is not the greatest war God history has ever known, whose glory was advanced through war. In fact, when we look into the Bible, in Daniel chapter 11, it talks about the Antichrist. While many Western uh, prophecy teachers believe that the Antichrist is an atheist, if we examine the text of the Bible, we find not exactly true. In fact, that the Antichrist in the Bible, he is described as he believes in a God. He follows a God, and that is a God of war. That is, is explicitly stated in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, which is a God of war, and a God which his fathers did not know. He does believe in a God. He is not atheist. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Islam has zakah. Once a Muslim every year has to offer Allah through the proceeds for the advancement of the glory of Allah, also in jihad, from the proceeds of gold, silver, and the monetary values that Muslims have. Thus, in verse 39, it says, he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. There it is. The text is speaking to the believers that the Antichrist believes in a foreign god that is foreign to the believers. Well, Allah is a god of war, and indeed it is a foreign god to the believers. So, if he advances a war against the strongest fortresses, well, the strongest military might in this case, that means Antichrist is not even the strongest military might in the world. Every Muslim is proud of the glory days when Islam ruled the ancient world. The God of the Quran demands endless war and the bloodshed of unbelievers in the war. 
believers, it says in the Quran, wage war against such infidels as are your neighbors and let them find rigorous and harshness in you. And that is to mean to terrorize the unbelievers. The Quran seems to match, you know, greatly with what the uh, Bible regarding Antichrist. This jihad holy war is mostly directed against Christians and Jews. I quote the Quran, make war upon such those whom the scriptures have been given. It is a war against the Jews and the Christians uh, as they believe not in the God, not in Allah. In other words, the Christians and the Jews deny the God of Islam. So there is a difference between the gods that the, both parties believe in. Islam believes in a different God by the admission of Islam itself. They say that they do not believe in Allah and have forbidden his apostles uh, and have forbidden what his apostles forbid. In other words, the Christians, you know, they eat pork and they follow things that most Islam does not allow. They don't forbid what Islam forbids. They don't believe in the same God they believe. They claim war on them. So it is pretty clear looking at the uh, Quran with the Bible that Islam seems to match perfectly what Daniel 11 describes as the Antichrist. This hatred that is built into Islam stems from the descriptive satanic instructions propagated in Islam itself. Yet in the West, Islamic movements hide this violence that Islam you know, adheres to by propagating the notion that Islam means peace. The Bible warns that whoever hides his hatred has lying lips. When it comes to Islam, always think cavalry, not Calvary. So how has Satan persuaded millions of Muslims to die for Allah? This is the crux of the whole issue most Westerners do not understand. Why does a Muslim suicide bomber blow himself up? Why do they have to die? This is the uh, cunningness of Satan to persuade Muslims that God never died for them at Calvary, yet they must die for him in raids and military conquests. So what motivates Muslims to fight and risk death? Simply jihadism is a message of salvation. For one to die in the cause of Allah is an assurance of salvation and entry to paradise. It's a corruption of Christian dogma. Uh, the difference is that it is the shaheed or the Muslim martyr who now can atone for his own sins. Therefore, dying in jihad is the ultimate way to transit one's soul instantly to paradise. Salvation as understood in the Christian perspective is only through the death of one perfect man, Jesus Christ. In Islam, the idea of Christ dying for all humanity is rejected. In fact, this rejection is one of the main reasons Islam was founded. Islam considers this doctrine to be a corruption of the original faith and views itself as the restoration of that original faith. Yet Islam does retain a measure of Christianity's idea of salvation, that atonement accomplished by death. However, the big difference is that in Islam, it's not the death of Christ that entitles you to go to heaven but your own death. So important is this concept that a shaheed in Islam can be an intercessor for 70 members of his or her family. Without this jihad style death, you had better obtain enough merit to outweigh your sins so you will go to paradise. This is a, a dilemma basically conf that confounds all Muslims. The similarity in understanding this salvation is interesting. A suicide martyr is called fidai, from the source word fidya, sacrificial lamb, as used in the Christian creed. And the best way for one to assure the salvation is to die in jihad. From a Christian perspective, however, this is blasphemy, because a Muslim becomes like God. To say that you can obtain salvation by your own death, you have proclaimed yourself to possess attributes of God. It is no wonder why the Antichrist says, I will be like God. The salvation in Islam occurs upon the death of the Muslim while he fights, and the first drop of his blood is shed. Quote, a martyr has six bounties. He will be forgiven with the first drop of his blood that is spilt. He will see his place in paradise at the time of his death. He will be saved from the great horror 
on the day of judgment. A crown of dignity will be placed on his head, so on and so forth. And that's what Muhammad basically taught. It's not the issue of only gaining virgins in paradise, as you know, many Westerners focus on this issue. But it's also the ability to become an intercessor for 70 members of his family. This is why my cousin Raid, 16-year-old boy, he, went, uh, to, he goes to Ben Yehuda Street to plant a bomb. He is killed by the Israelis, and my aunt Fatima has a wedding celebration for him. Why? Because he is now interceding for my aunt and the family to go to paradise. Allah in the Quran gives this assurance of salvation. In the Quran it states, And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead. Rather, they are alive with their Lord, receiving provisions. And to alleviate the thoughts of any pain, it states, the pain that a martyr feels at the time of death will be reduced so greatly that he will only feel as if he was stung by a mosquito. As an example of this assurance of salvation and the idea of martyrdom in Islam, uh, uh, Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, gives a story of a Bedouin who came to the Prophet who accepted Islam and said, I wish to migrate to Medina with you. Then after the battle, the Muslims had gained some booty of war, in other words, valuables that they gained after a battle. Uh, when the Bedouin returned, they gave him his share. So he asked them, what is this? They replied, it is your share from the booty which the Prophet gave us to hold on for you. So the Bedouin took the booty and went to the Prophet and asked, What is this? The Prophet said, Your share of the booty. The Bedouin said, This is not why I believe in you and follow you. Rather, I follow you so that I can get shot by an arrow right here. And he pointed to his throat. Then die and enter paradise. The Prophet said, If you are sincere, then Allah will grant you your wish. After a short while, fighting resumed and the Bedouin's body was brought to the Prophet and the story goes as the Prophet you know prayed upon his body and he did you know he was sincere to Allah and grant Allah granted him his wish to die as a martyr and so the story goes yet salvation in Christianity is much different in one quote Jesus said unto the Apostles verily verily I say unto you except ye who eats the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood Ye has no life in you, who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eat my flesh and drink my blood dwells in me, and I in him. Islam rejects the blood of Christ. How then can Christians be saved through the blood of Jesus? While the mention of these verses that Jesus quoted are symbolic. We don't drink his blood literally or eat his flesh literally. Yet in Islam, there has been stories that the Prophet talked about while he was in battle, for example. In the battle of Uhud, the helmet rings had been taken out of the Prophet's cheek, that is the Prophet Muhammad. The, the story goes that blood flowed from the radiant face of that uh, Lord of the Pure, as they called him. And my father Malik ibn Sinan sucked the wounds with his mouth swallowing the blood. When they said to my father, Malik, is blood to be drunk? My father replied, yes, the blood of the Prophet of God I drink like a beverage. At that time, His Excellency the Prophet said, whoever wishes to see one who has mixed my blood with his, let him look at Malik ibn Sinan. Anyone whose blood touches mine, him the fire of hell shall not desire. In other words, they receive automatic salvation by drinking the blood of Muhammad. Bizarre narrations like this are too many to quote. They speak of drinking Muhammad's urine and eating his excrement. Would such abominations be chosen over the precious blood of the sinless Lamb of God? Muhammad wanted to be a savior. Never has there ever been such a perverse heresy as Islam.